Peter determined a great deal of the character because the concept that Lincoln Levinson had, here's a guy, he looks like a bum, but he's really Sherlock Holmes. So people constantly underestimate him. And he uses that to his advantage. advantage. That was the essential dynamic of the character. Peter Falk, oddly enough, was a great deal like that himself. I mean, uh, Peter was, was a character. And as the show became more successful, um, he wouldn't necessarily read the script till he got to the stage. And the shows kept going over and over and over. But it was such a phenomenal hit that nobody said anything. I mean, you say, well, what are you going to do, right? But uh, <clears throat> Peter uh, had turned down doing a series initially when the first two-hour movie was produced called Prescription Murder. Then his business manager went south with all his money, and he was totally broke. An actor named Wayne Rogers, who people remember from MASH, was also a big-time businessman. Wayne was in $100 million projects, and I used to play in a Sunday morning game down in Rodeo Park, pickup game, and Wayne was there, and I didn't even know he was an actor. People kept asking him about stocks. <laughs> and then I saw him, and I said, oh, he's an actor, and then he went on to do the series. He was a nice guy, uh, Wayne. But he straightened Peter's finances out, and in doing so, they made a deal to do Columbo. Peter got $26,500 per episode for that. The second year, when I was coming on, and of course I knew Peter from the pilot, he said, uh, listen, I can't talk to you. It's not personal, but I just can't talk to you, okay? That's it, I just, just want to tell you, I can't talk to you. I said, okay. Then I get a call from the Business Affairs Department, and they say, Peter has announced that he can no longer work under these conditions. He wants more money. So he got more money. First they offer him an increased percentage of the profits. Now the profits are not worth anything, basically. Nobody ever gets the profits. And in fact, Jim Garner learned that the hard way at Universal. So he said, no, I don't want more profits. I want more money. <laughs> so he got more money. By the time the show went off the air, and I, I don't remember how many seasons there were, six or seven, I was long yeah. gone by then, he was getting $500,000 an episode. When they brought the show back, which was, I believe, in the 80s, uh, on ABC, he was getting paid a million dollars an episode. And because they couldn't get him to commit to production on any given script, uh, they made him the executive producer, which was a serious mistake because now he had the responsibility. And I always felt, although I never heard him articulate it, that he must have felt a lot of pressure coming off a show that was such a rabid hit around the world now bringing it back, if it's not as good, if it doesn't succeed as well, you know, was this a good idea? And I personally didn't think it was a good idea, but they made it a bunch of them. It would take them forever to get the shows made. In fact, in the first season when they were doing the shows for NBC, the shows would go over. I mean, it would be a 10-day show, the show would go 18 days. And at one point, uh, NBC says, you know, we got to do something about this. The Universal says, look, we'll produce the show, but we're not going to pay any of the overages. You have to pay everything. We're not going to pay any deficits. So they took the show on, and then the show, when it got up to about 26 days, they canceled the show. They just said, wrap it up, we're done. And that was the end of it. And then Peter came back, you know, later with the second version of the series.